Hey, True Believers, England teen here, and uh, <laughs> I've got, got a co-star. Uh, hello to Dragon Majesty. How you doing? Hi, everyone. Should I just change my handle to Dragon Master to help you out? Maybe. Just that might. I think I even called you Dragon Master right there. Uh, <laughs> uh, to, to illustrate your point, yes. Um, <laughs> so I'm here with Eric Breen. How y'all doing tonight? Not Eric Brewer, by the way, uh, which is another name I keep messing up. This is Twiddles. Um, I I was typing, and he figured my hand was a good perch, so I'm kind of stuck with him right now. And uh, tonight we're going to start a uh, we're going to start off the top ten. I'm hoping to do this every Tuesday. Um, uh, you know, conditions conditions uh, of there you go permitting. But uh, this week's topic, we figured, why not? Let's do a top 10 of the best of John Byrne. John Byrne was huge during the 80s. That is That, that might be an understatement. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I would say the 80s were owned by two people uh, as far as writers and artists are concerned, and that would be Frank Miller and John Byrne. That's that's true. I said, you know, when you think of the 80s, you know, Burn, or Miller's going to come to mind first, and maybe even Alan Moore because of their, you know, watershed accomplishments. But Burn was, you know, you know, at the top of his game pretty much mm -hmm. throughout the entire decade. Yeah, I'm. I have. I know. I understand what Alan, and I'm never going to take away the Watchmen, obviously. But I think, uh, like, not a lot of people are talking about V for Vendetta, you know, and those are, and only the uh, the real the the real deep dives talk about swamp things uh but it, so uh, but i agree with you i think uh yeah definitely those three but uh, i i dig on his uh books i'm a big john byrne fan um he was uh he was known for being a little bit salty and arguing with everybody and it didn't help that when people were talking about creator rights and getting uh and getting the them some royalties for their characters he was one of the ones that said oh just hush you know what you're signing just be a company man do your job and go home <laughs> when, when i heard about that i was like no seriously he said that but uh when i found out i was like damn i didn't think any of the artists or writers would be on that particular side but there you go he must have knew he had a future in editing or thought he did <laughs> All right. So uh, uh, just for the record, I, I think Burn is to me, Burn is number one of those three of, of those three. Because like I said there's, you know, it, it, when you have to produce every month and still come up with two of the I would say two of the five best, you know, if not, like I said if you got Watchmen, Dark Knight, but you know, then you've got you know, his Fantastic Four run and Man of Steel. Mm -hmm. Which, which are you know that those are held in pretty high esteem too, and he was doing that on a monthly basis and sometimes more than one a month, which you know, can't be you know understated. Well, yeah, and that's that that is uh, that's a really good point because Alan Moore had Swamp Thing, and Frank Miller had the uh, the tail end of Daredevil, but after that it was here's my next mini series, here's you know this specific story. Um, it was never, they never really went monthly after that. Frank Miller and, uh, and Alan Moore. No, I can't remember. Was he still doing Swamp Thing while he was doing Watchmen? I would have to look. <laughs> I would have to check that out. The memory, you know, my memory is not that good. Uh, so we have in a disguise saying, kill the bird ain't going to happen. Uh, Till Hilliams already picking John Man Byrne, Man of Steel is number one. We'll see. Uh, let, we'll see if it even makes it. Cause here's the thing. And this is something I mentioned to, uh, I mentioned, uh, to, to Breen here. I didn't want to, I didn't want to cheat cause it would be so easy to cheat and say, oh, well, his, his best is the X-Men. His best is fantastic Four. his best is she Hulk. I wanted to be specific. What story do you like from X-Men? What story do you like from the uh, fantastic four? And so on. So we're going to go that deep. We're not just going to talk about overall, uh, overall arcs we're going to go into specific issues which also is good for us because um be, because uh that leads it so we can uh 
we could talk about more burn in just a second or, or, you know, next, uh, next show and everything. So it works out. All righty. That's where I expected a comment of some sort, but we'll go on. <laughs> well, at least I'm on camera. So they saw the nod. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You're really good for radio, brother. Uh, well, it depends on what you write in your contracts as in a disguise. <laughs> it's salty. That's why. Yeah. John Byrne is uh, well known for his arguments and everything. So I, I don't know. You're, you were actually older than I was. So what, what would you have to say about all that? Well, yeah, I had just heard stories, you know, of, of his, you know, kind of, what's the word irascible behavior at shows. If mm -hmm. I'm getting the right word on actually, he was, he was at a Mansfield convention that I went to in the mid eighties and my, you know, a friend of mine, you know, met him and, you know, said he was, you know, like I said, kind of, you know, curmudgeon even then, but you know, I've never been one to, you know, it never mattered to me to meet the creators because I was probably when he was off, you know, standing in Burns line, I was probably on the floor looking for quarter books, but um, yeah. So e even then he had somewhat of a reputation, but again, then, you know, there was no social media. So, you know, you just had word of mouth and what people said, you know, well, I met him and, you know, and the next person might say, well, he was nice to me. So, yeah, it's just, you know, I mean, he had a reputation for being, you know, kind of crabby, but, you know, but not, you know, not mean spirited to customers. You just, you know, you sort of like if you if you were waiting for an autograph, it's like, you know, here, let me sign it and get to the next one. Yeah. So, I mean, that's. Yeah. OK, uh, let's see. We're getting a hail Zenu. Hallowed be thy name, says Robert Roberts uh, coming this summer. OK, yeah, you know, that's a whole other thing. Um, and I just noticed, by the way, uh, before the show, I changed my shirt and I'm wearing it out inside out. So that's always a nice visual as well. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to do our little, this is our top 10. He's got five different. I've got five different and it's not the top 10. It's a top 10. So why don't you start it off? What, what, what would you say is your number five? I'm going to start with Superman number two from the burn relaunch. Oh, good one. <clears throat> now the. The plot of this particular issue is Lex Luthor has become obsessed with finding out who Superman's identity, what his identity is. And he's got his you know, team working on it round the clock. And he, he gets some good news and he wants to share it with one of his you know, female employees. So he invites her to dinner and she says, well, I'm flattered, but I have another engagement. And he squeezes her hand and says, no, you don't understand. I meant tonight. And she, of course, has no choice but to agree to meet with him. And and that was kind of like an early you know, an indication. You got a glimpse of it in Man of Steel, but you found out that you know Lex is really not a nice guy. No. And then he gets some good news from uh, Jordan D. White. Um, I, I mean, Happersan, um, about a way to weaken Superman using Metallo's you know, heart which is made of kryptonite. Of course, that's the bad news is it's still attached to Metallo and Lex says, ah, no problem, just rips it out of his chest. So now he has kryptonite. So he sends some people to, you know, to, to check into the Kents to see if he can find anything. They've got information that, you know, that he grew up that, you know, um, Clark Kent and Lana Lang had some kind of connection. Lana Lang has a connection to Superman. So he sends a couple of his people back to Smallville to find out if he can find anything by, you know, at, at the Kent farm and Lana, who they're also looking for interrupts the two men and they kidnap her and take her back to Lex who proceeds to, you know, hold her captive for a couple of days, beat her half to death and then let her go hoping she'll lead him back to Clark. So he has, you know, he, he, he you know, meets, um, you know, Amanda, the female employees, you know, for dinner, and the next day, um, you know, Clark goes back to his apartment and Lana is, you know, hiding in the closet, you know, beaten half to death. And, you know, Superman, you know, decides to find out what the hell happened. And while that's going on, you, there's another scene where Lex is in a bathrobe, as is Amanda. And she's calling him Mr. Luther. And she goes, oh, Amanda, you have to call me Lex now. And 
that wasn't creepy at all. So <laughs> here, here's a question, of course. Uh, do you, which which Lex do you prefer? Do you prefer businessman Lex, which of course was introduced to us by John Byrne, or do you prefer super villain super suit Lex? Oh, uh, without question, businessman Lex. But I think if if Byrne made any mistake with the character, it was it, making him ruthless. Fine, making him a sexual predator. On top of that, <laughs> kind of kind of skeevy and kind of didn't have the long game in mind because I mean there's certain things that you can overlook in comic book you know parlance. Yeah, yeah. You know, like I said you know you, you're always able to forgive the the murder here and there because it is you know there are comics, but. Yeah, just just knowing that he's basically forcing his employees into sex. I mean, that's just kind of, eh. and they kind of going forward, they just kind of you know swept that part of his personality under the rug. Yeah, they, as, as they, they could kill a million people, but when they kill the dog, that's uh, yeah. when it's overboard. <laughs> that's that's a good point. so. You know, it, Superman decides to confront Lex, and he um, you know, breaks into his office and he starts threatening him, and you know, Lex just kind of goes like that and Superman starts to double over because he's wearing his kryptonite ring. Mm -hmm. And so he basically goes, well, I could kill you, but that's not how I want to play this game. I want you to have nightmares. Yeah. You know, I, you know, I want you to know it's coming, et cetera, et cetera. And then, you know, so he, he has no choice but to leave and he takes Lana with him and he goes back to the farm and the Kents are fine. And he, you know, he, he thought they were missing and, but they, they had just finished up cleaning up the house from where Luther's men had you know, ransacked it. But then the story ends with they've got all the information and they fed it into the computer. And Amanda, you know, basically gives him a dissertation of what the findings were. And it's, you know, it's like listening to Charlie Brown's teacher for about three or four panels. But the, the printout comes to the conclusion that Clark Kent is Superman. And, and, and Amanda goes, well, it's, it's so simple. I said, I would have never thought of that, but it makes so much sense. And Lex goes to a computer, maybe, but not to me, maybe to a soulless machine. But why would a God like Superman bother to have such a mundane secret, you know, secret identity. And so he fires Amanda and says, there's no room in my organization for people who can't see the obvious. Yeah. That that's is, how the story ends. Fine. Um, and this actually leads to uh, another story we might talk about uh, later where the person comes back and uh, with a piece of kryptonite and goes up to Clark Kent just to prove their point. That's a, that's a pretty good pull. I, uh, I went with, no, I don't have the comic on me, so I guess I'll have to do it this way. But um, I went with an alpha flight. I figured I would go outside the box a little bit and it's Al alpha flight issue number 12. Um, in the issue before it, Omega flight attacked the guardian and, uh, it's a, it's just this huge, it's this huge brawl. This entire issue is almost one large fight between alpha flight and Omega flight. And one of the things I really liked about this is some of the ideas about a character that's just a side character. Um, I, I even, I, I gotta look his name's flashback and what he could do is he was kind of like a multiple man. And um, he could bring uh, people like his, himself from different time periods, which part of me wondered what were they doing? Like, and why are they always in outfit? Like if he's pulling himself from a year and a half, how is he knowing, you know, you're not pulling yourself out from uh, to help you, but you're on the toilet, you know, it's always <laughs> like in the, in, co in costume and ready to go. But uh it's still, I thought that was an interesting idea for a character, but the main thing about this and what really uh, shocked, I mean, if you were an Alpha Flight fan like I was, and if you were into this book at all, um, the Guardian, who was uh, the very first Alpha Flight member we saw in X-Men, uh, was the leader of the team, and there's a scene where the, he just gets the T-total hell beat out of him. And Heather's coming running up and he realizes his suit is about to blow up and he's uh, talking, okay, I've got to be calm. I've got to go through this methodically. I got to do this. And uh, you see the countdown going on. And at the end, Heather yells out for him and he turns and that's the second he needed. And kaboom, we've seen so many heroes 
not die. You know, it's the last minute, D, 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 zero, zero point one, you know, okay, we're saved. Guardian blew up. And it, as much as we were expecting, even in issue number 13, for him to come back, instead, we had a funeral. And it actually dealt with his, uh, it dealt with his death in a very mature way. He was gone. Heather was not in the next issue. Heather wasn't like, well, we need to move on. You know, she was devastated. Everybody around, they actually dealt with the death in this issue as well. Not this, just this issue, but in this particular storyline, which is also something you don't really see to this day. I mean, Superman died. He got beaten to death. And we never saw ramification. We never saw like uh, any kind of mental anguish. If he ever uh, went up against a, a, a villain, he figured was more powerful than him. He never lost it one way or another. Uh, they never dealt with that kind of thing. But in Alpha Flight, they actually did. And I think one of the best things about this storyline, one of the best things about this issue and the entire title that while it, it had John Byrne on it was that it was such a small title that he could experiment with story like that. And that's one of the reasons why I particularly like the issue as well as the entire series. That's a good point. Yeah. Well, yeah, that, that, that does happen when, um, where, where are we? We're, we're on an even footing. There we go. <laughs> but, um, that, that does happen when somebody can jump onto something new. And a lot of people even said, Hey, you know what? Let's, can we get Brian Michael Bendis on the smaller titles and have them stop around with superman <laughs> but yeah and also you know burn had had built up a heck of a lot of goodwill at marvel by that point so that i mean you know he i, I imagine he had a heck of a lot of creative freedom on fantastic four and i'm sure he had 100 creative freedom on alpha flight yeah oh most definitely and, and he's just one of those kind of uh definitely at that time i mean he was at the height of john burn powers yes at that point in time and he was also getting pissed at everybody. Uh, this was around the uh, time also where he was he was really mad. He didn't want to do X Men anymore. His uh, people were saying he could do something, and then they turned their backs. And that's one of the reasons why he went to DC because DC had been courting him all through the eighties. Now he he started Alpha Flight fairly soon after he started Fantastic Four, didn't it? Didn't he? Say that, again. How much time? How long had he been on Fantastic Four when he did when he started on Alpha Flight? Well, let's see. This Alpha Flight was in 1984, so you got to figure this was um, July. So you got to figure 1983 was the first issue. Um, okay. And uh, the next fan, the Fantastic Four I'm talking about is 1982. So yeah, he would be, he would have been on Fantastic Four and Alpha Flight at the same time. Yeah, so he'd been on Fantastic Four for about a year or so when he got Alpha Flight, right? Yep. And I'm guessing by that time they probably said, yeah, do whatever you want. All righty. Uh, so, yeah, that's my number five. Uh, Rob, actually, I'm getting to it. Uh, I'm I'm doing it. I'm actually doing the uh, I'm doing the Canadian superheroes video. Um, this is actually commissioned video as well. This is this was brought up as somebody said, hey, you know what? John Byrne was such an influential thing. And uh, it made me think, why don't we just start doing a top 10? And I could start with the John Byrne stuff. So there you go. Um, let's see. Who's gay in Alpha Flight? That would be North Star. Keep Bendis on Jinx World, Else World Stories. I think he would do very well with that kind of stuff. Uh, so there you go. You are, of course, referring to North. Yep. Burn quit off of flight before he quit FF. He was doing Hulk at the same time. Well, there you go. Yeah, and he did that that after the the Hulk tenure didn't last long at all. I think only like six issues. I don't even remember that. I, I probably would if I saw the. It was three fourteen through three nineteen, and if I'm not mistaken, that was right about the time he left for DC. Because I want to say that was yeah. right around uh, late eighty five, early eighty six. Cool, cool. So, what do you have for your number four? I'm going to go with the Legends miniseries that came out in late 1986 and basically started not long after the crisis. And this miniseries, it was written by John Ostrander and Len Wein and with art by John Byrne. But there's too many things in here that you know that Byrne had creative input. There's too many mm -hmm. Byrne-isms in this. 
for for him not to have. And this base, this series basically set up the new DC universe post crisis, and it begins with Darkseid hatching a plan to to make humanity lose faith in its heroes, and one of the ways he does that is he dispatches you know glorious Godfrey to Earth in the in the guise of G Gordon Godfrey, and he's he's basically. For those of you old enough to remember, kind of almost like a Morton Downey Jr. type character, <laughs> where he's just you know he's there to stirring the pot, you know, you're hammering home the fact that superheroes are are bad, they're you know evil, blah blah blah. And while he's doing that and sowing seeds of discontent among the adults, the you know, Dark Side sends a, a giant called Macro Man to Earth, and Shazam goes to fight him. And he and Macroman grabs Shazam, and the only way Billy Batson can think to get away from him is to you know turn back to you know Billy Batson because he'll he'll shrink and he can slip out of his hands. But the the force of you know the change causes Macroman to seemingly die, and that traumatizes Billy Batson because he believes he's killed somebody, so he vows never to become Shazam again. So. Yeah, you know, yeah. You know, step one completed. Um, then, the, as the series progresses, you know that you know, there. There's also you know Brimstone, another giant, which you know some superheroes have been trying to fight, like your know, Martian Manhunter, Cosmic Boy, uh, Flash, Changeling, um, Guy Gardner, etc. And while that's going, while this is going on, Amanda Waller's introduced, and they decide that you know they need something. They, they need bad guys to stop bad guys. So she creates, she recreates Task Force X, which basic, which eventually becomes the Suicide Squad, which is introduced in issue three, where they where they attempt to stop Brimstone to you know, varying degrees of success. And and in the you know, the, the the point of the Suicide Squad is you know obviously in the name anyone's expendable and blockbuster is killed on the first mission on the first mission. So as, as we go forward, um, dark side, you know, in, in his mind, he's things have been, you know, progressing, you know, perfectly. And the whole time he's been where he's been watching events unfold. The phantom stranger has been standing next to him saying, you know, basically not so fast dark side. I still have faith in humanity. They'll come through at the end. And, and, to, and basically what he's relying on are the children. The children don't lose hope. And that's kind of the kind of the subplot of this series is, you know, you may be able to convince the adults of something, but the innocence of children will always, you know, come through. And they get to, you know, in, in issue by issue five, Dr. Fate decides to assemble all the heroes for one more battle against Dark Side and his war hounds, which are some giant metallic, you know, attack dogs and, and parademons. So he basically assembles the, you know, the, the heroes that are available, which, you know, Superman, Batman, Martian Manhunter, I said Flash, Changeling, um, Guy Gardner, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. And um, no, I'm missing, a, I'm leaving out a plot point, but maybe it'll come back okay. to me. You're covering it pretty uh pretty well here man <laughs> well and um I, I did leave out this you know that president reagan had issued a cease and desist order on superhero behavior or superhero activity which was another part of dark side's plan that you know it yeah. not you know, he, you know reagan wasn't in his thrall but he went along with it because you know for the for the good people because people were, were basically rioting anywhere that they saw superheroes in fact in issue two you know a mob basically beats jason todd to death and he's, you know, you know his broken leg, broken arm, laid up in the hospital. It's a preview for, of what's to come. <laughs> ah! <laughs> yeah. So, you know, the, end- the sad thing is, in, and I'm going to say this before somebody else in the comment says this. If this was written today, Trump would be a thrall of dark side. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And, and I will say it to, to, I don't know. I mean, I, I know Ostrander and, and Wine leaned left, but to their credit, Reagan was treated absolutely fairly in this miniseries. And 
you know, so issue six is the, is the, you know, brawl for it all, so to speak. And it also introduces Wonder Woman and you know, her, her opening scene where a guy Gardner, you know, says, you know, looking good, babe, you might have a future in this business. And of course she says, you know, if you're on the side of the angels, as you claim, how about if you stop ogling me and get back in the fight? <laughs> and she, she goes, I use it. And his, his thought point is, wow, that is one tough broad. <laughs> So obviously, you know, they, they win the fight and um, at, at the end, you know, the, this, this little girl who, who had befriended Billy Batson is, you know, she, she's trying to stop the adults from attacking the superheroes who still, you know, haven't figured out that they're being duped. And um, Godfrey gets so frustrated with the little girl that he smacks her and that wakes up the adults. And they yeah. finally realize that, you know, so, so and then he gets desperate and, he, you know, he he pulls Dr. Fate's helmet out of his uh, coat and goes, I'll show you. And he puts the helmet on and, of course, pr proceeds to become a drooling vegetable because all of the knowledge is too much for him to handle. So he, you know, basically just collapses on himself. And like I said, the, the, you know, the good guys win and there's an attack at the White House where. They shoot Reagan and Reagan just brushes it off and says, yeah, that was, that was a mistake. And he, you know, decks the guy and it turns out it was Martian Manhunter in disguise. And, you know, that's when they said, there's a, there's a scene where Reagan is portrayed as, you know, actually in possession of his faculties. And, you know, one of his, one of his secret service guys said, I still don't trust that Martian. And he basically says, you know, I'll just shut up. He is, <laughs> but yeah, so they, at the end of the story, they, you know, Dr. Fate, you know, says, you know, we need to, you know, we need to become a force for good again. And they go around all the heroes that are there and say, you know, who's with me? And basically they set up the Justice League title that would debut a few months later. And like I said, it introduced Wonder Woman. And basically this series set up the new DCU. It really did. I, I was just thinking that I was thinking, you know, um, Crisis on Infinite Earths just kind of changed everything, but it really was stuff like this that really got it out there. And this is what actually said, this is how we're going to be from here on in. Oh, absolutely. I said, well, I mean, you know, I said crisis could only serve the purpose that it did. And then I said, and that, you know, instead of, you know, they could have fumbled post crisis, but, you know, they didn't. I mean, they, they just hit home run after home run with Man of Steel, Legends, and, you know, year one, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, they just, you know, yeah, the, you know, the, the term is it hit, you know, knock the ball out of the park a ton in those next couple of years. And I said this, then this was definitely a big part of it. Great series. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, let me see. Where's the, uh Oh, okay. I'm looking for something specific. So while, while we're doing this and I realized uh, they weren't the uncanny X-Men, there we go. Okay. <laughs> Not uh, they weren't the uncanny X-Men when they first started. They were uh, actually just the X-Men for a little bit cuz I'm looking for a specific number that I realized I was on eBay for. Whoops. And not the actual issue, because then we're going to be talking about that later. So let's go there. And my next book that I would like to talk about, even though I was just bringing up the X-Men, isn't an X-Men book. It is, in fact, a Fantastic Four, um, which, yes, of course, we could we can uh, say, hey, yeah, John Byrne's entire run. Check it out. And you're not going to you're not going to find something you're going to hate there. But one of my favorite issues is something not a lot of people know about. It's called uh, Nightmare. It's Fantastic Four issue number 248. It's got the Fantastic Four and uh, it's got the Inhumans in it. And this is a weird issue. I mean, this is a bizarre issue where they find themselves on this world where they're the size of bugs. And the every m move that they make, every move that the uh, people around the 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 inhabitants of this world around them make is disastrous to them because of the size the sheer size they can't do anything at one point um everybody's getting wiped out and black bolt has to 
communicate. So they figure, you know, uh, the only way that they can say, Hey, look, stop doing what you're doing. We're not pests. We're not insects. You know, you're actually hurting us is if black bolt uses his voice to go up and, uh, and talk to him. And instead of course, uh, it, it having that devastating effect that it would normally have, it just got the, uh, the giant's attention to which case, and this is why you're seeing uh, Invisible Girl melting, is that the uh, creature then decides, oh, oh, wow, yeah, we have pests in the house. And he literally sprays bug spray <laughs> on them. And uh, it's a really great issue. Um, obviously, I, I hate the title of the book because it gives it away. You know, I mean, it's called Nightmare. Guess what? <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, overall, though, it's definitely one to check out. I don't want to go too much into detail on it. Just read it for yourself. It really is done uh, really well. It's got a lot of sweet tension to it, and uh, you, you get a highlight of every character involved. Like it starts off with Triton, and Triton's usually like you know, the. He's like Aquaman in the 1970s when it comes to the Inhumans. <laughs> um, he's just there to to uh, react and to comment on what Gorgon's doing rather than anything he does himself. And he gets himself its chance to shine in this one. It's a really good book. I highly recommend it. It's Once again, it's called uh, Nightmares and it's Fantastic Four number 248. This was what really got me hooked. I mean, there's a lot of great burn issues but after this one i was like okay i'm a huge fan <laughs> i said there's a lot to choose from in that ff run especially the first 30 or so issues yeah do you do you remember that issue at all um vaguely um i started reading re rereading the burn ffs mm -hmm. but i like i i basically stalled out after about 12 issues and got sidetracked onto something else but I, and I need to I need to discipline myself to go all the way through again because I've I've got a couple of these. I wanted to talk about some of the uh, quieter issues that came and went that you know not not any like everybody knows the trial of Galactus and everybody knows the Man of Steel and all that kind of stuff. I figured I would for a couple of them I wanted to point out some of these like the death of Guardian. Nobody talks about Guardian anymore. Much nobody really talks about Alpha Flight anymore. <laughs> That's true. The last time I saw Alpha Flight, Captain Marvel was a member of it, and it was in space, and it had nothing to do with Canada anymore. So, okay, gut the heart out of it and just put the title on. You know, it's like uh, the founder from McDonald's. We don't want anything else, just your name. Yeah, yeah. E everything's a mantle, and everything's a title. Yeah. <laughs> nothing else matters. <sighs> Yeah. Godfrey was a new god. He shouldn't have succumbed to Naboo's madness so fast. And his power was persuasion. So you would think that he would have a he would have a mind for it. Sorry in disguise likely get you fired. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh so what's your number three? All right. Next up, I'm, I went with a couple of issues of Marvel Team Up, um, 61 and 62, which is a, a little two-part story. Uh, involving the Super Scroll, um, it starts off with uh, you know, Spider Man is in the Baxter Building where the events of Team Up sixty had just ended, and he ends up getting attacked by what he thinks is the Fantastic Four, and uh, you know he, you know they they're coming at him one at a time, but he's got no defense, and Mister Fantastic holds him up, and the thing belts him, you know out of the building and into the night where he's caught by the human torch. And of course, you know, you know human torch makes, you know, Johnny makes a couple cracks and Spider-Man, you know, basically, you know, fights back thinking is, you know, okay, what's going on here? You know, you just tried to kill me and now you're doing this. And then, you know, um, he, you know, Johnny says, well, you're nuts. Is it, you know, he goes, you tell me you didn't attack me. And he goes, no, we're, you know, the FF's out of town. And I was over. He goes, well, then who did? He goes, well, it must be someone who can mimic our powers. And then he goes, oh, my God. And he flies back to the Baxter building and he finds the totem that had been given to him that has, you know, that had Super Scrolls essence mm -hmm. trapped in it. And he realizes he's escaped. So basically, you know, the scroll goes on a rampage looking for this power crystal. And they track him into this train yard where Spider-Man comes up with a way that he thinks he can stop him 
by you know rigging up this device that once he flies through, if they can you know send a current or whatever, it, it should you know, negate his powers. And he basically you know he, the Human Torch gets knocked out of the fight almost immediately, and Spider Man's left to fight him alone. And he's you know clearly no match for the Super Scroll, but you know he you know he keeps you know going forward, and you know he, he try in, in this issue really gives you an idea of just how heroic in nature you know spider-man is that no matter what the odds are he is going to give it his best shot and you know even if he has no chance well he he you know, it, you know, he gets basically gets his head handed to him the torch gets his head handed to him and there there's a great little line when um you know where you know johnny says um you know now this uh, Lieutenant Scar says this job needs the whole FF or the Avengers, and the Torch says, "And brother, you sure ain't them. Be smart for once. I know it'll be a strain. Stay out of this. Stay alive." And of course, you know he doesn't listen because he goes off to, you know, challenge him again, and you know so he he, he lures him into the trap that he'd set, you know, sets it off. It doesn't work. It just makes him stronger. So now he's got to face basically. Super scroll on super steroids. So he's basically screwed. Well, so the next issue, he you know, he continues the fight and he's you know getting it handed to him again. And Ms. Marvel, who's or Carol Danvers, who's on a cruise ship, you know, sees what's going on and gets involved. And when she turns to cat or to Ms. Marvel, she instantly has just an irrational seething hatred for the super scroll which goes back to, you know, the, you know, I guess, you know, the, the, the Cree part of her Ms. Marvel persona. And, you know, they, they come up with a plan that's kind of similar to what happened in the issue before, only this time it's, it's Ms. Marvel that, you know, comes up with, you know, the, the way to try to negate his powers. And it's, yeah. And, and I'm assuming that the reason why they did that was because this was only 10 months into her own book. Claremont, if I'm not mistaken, was writing her book and he was writing Team Up. So they wanted to do something to make her, you know, look awesome without, you know, hurting Spidey, which which they managed to pull off. So they they worked together to stop him. And you know, the second time, you know, it, they are able to, you know, stop him. Whatever it is that they did, basically, you know, the power crystal that he was trying to get his hands on, they end up using that to basically send him you know somewhere they don't know he just basically you know blips out of existence and it's it's just a really good two-part story that really showcases just how you know it's one of the best examples of spider-man's you know you know heroism mm -hmm. that, that you that, that you can you know point to and like i said it, it you know johnny and you know peter's friendship was on full display it was perfect example of that you know the, the fighting the insults but the true camaraderie and caring about each other it was a nice introduction you know for anybody that hadn't picked up on ms marvel yet um it was is a way to you know introduce some more readers to her and she you know she was very you know, portrayed very well in this story and it's just it's just a great little two-part story that i don't think anybody remembers but <laughs> It was part of a great, you know, Claremont Byrne run on Team Up. You, uh, yeah, even uh, Paolo was saying that he forgets that uh, Claremont and Byrne had a run on Marvel Team Up. Some of the best, uh, I, I, what was it, Wood God or something like that? That, that was, was in 53 and 4. Yeah, that yeah. was the issue that I jumped on. I loved that issue, man. I read it dog-eared. Uh, remember that four part story where Spidey teams up with Nick Fury, Black Widow, and Shang Chi? That was pretty epic. Uh, my favorite burn FF issues were the sad ones about Sue and the baby, says uh, Maranya. Uh, hey, Kevin Vu, what's up? Uh, those were great. Doc Ock tried to save the baby, says, uh, whoops, I lost it, says Jerry Smith. Uh, congratulations to In a Disguise for becoming a great aunt on Friday, and howdy to Ash. Omak and She-Hulk graphic novels or something that George Peter wants to bring up. And at some point we'll talk about this. Uh, let's see. Uh, da -da -dum. What's up to Ash since uh, nobody else said it. Uh, number 18 Marvel graphic novel is one of the best She-Hulk stories, says Maranya. And uh, there you go. 
My number three, once again, I'm going to go a little bit obscure. I don't know. It's just my day for doing it. Not character-wise, though. Just uh, something like you, a lot of, a story that not a lot of people talk about, but it's a really good one. And uh, it's also one that Marvel backed out. It's called uh, Turning Point. It's The Thing Issue Number 3. And what happens in this one is um, that you've got Crystal and Quicksilver. They had a baby, Luna. And they were talking about putting him in the, the Terrigen Mist chambers. Now, Crystal was against it, you know, she because the Terrigen Mist could change their baby to anything. She thinks she's got a beautiful child and she doesn't want her to become uh, monstrous or anything. So there's this big debate on whether it should be mandatory that that uh, the royal babies go through this kind of thing or should they not? Um, Pietro being a mutant and loving it and he's a little bit arrogant, you know, just a touch. Mm -hmm. uh, he feels that if her, their baby is just a human, then it's going to be, uh, you know, if it's not a mutant or an inhuman that doesn't have superpowers, then it's going to be less and it's not worth it. And uh, the thing is almost an afterthought in his own book on this one. He'd been captured because he tried to help uh, uh, help save the baby and everything. Um, so they're having this big debate and he uh, Quicksilver just set, flat out says anything anything would be better than this. And he's talking about how Luna is uh, just human and kind of weak. And that's when Lockjaw goes, even me. And that's just, okay. Because up till this point, Lockjaw has been the dog. Yeah. He's treated like the dog. He's the pet, blah, blah. And we find out, no, he's an inhuman. He used to look human and now he's a dog and therefore people treated him like that. So that was the, that kind of, uh, that kind of hammered at home that, okay, maybe we'll wait. Maybe, you know, how much would you sacrifice in order to have this kind of power? And this, this blew me away. I love this story. It's incredible, powerful. And it's just, you know, two words, even me. And it changed it changed the Inhumans history. It changed everything. And I, I've loved this issue ever since. And I hate the fact that they retconned it and now Lockjaw is just a dog. Yeah, they, they changed it. The freaking cowards at Marvel changed it. So he's, he's just the family dog. That's it. Because they didn't want the Inhumans for seeming like they were uh, racist or something or uh, classist. I mean, it's a freaking royal family. Of course, they're classist. But, uh, you know, they've been treating Lockjaw like a dog. And now you're saying, wait a second, hold on. He's not. He's he's an uh, inhuman as well. And uh, so they backed out on it. But that story, man, when it came out, I was just blown away. It really did. Um, yeah. Did they did they retcon that out of spite? To, it was like to get back at burn for something. I mean, I, there wasn't there a reason behind why I, they I did that. I, the only reason I ever heard, and it might just be the difference between, you know, what they want you to know and what actually happened. But the only thing I ever heard of was that it was because the Royal family had been treating him like a dog. And if he was a human, if he was uh, just a regular person and then got turned into job, a dog, it kind of becomes a sort of slavery and they couldn't have they couldn't be heroes if Lockjaw was like that. That's but true. That's to me, it would have opened up all sorts of storylines talking about how somebody's appearance uh, can affect how other people treat them, and it could have been used for so many different ways, so many different good messages. If the story is good about how you never know what's on the inside, you know, obviously Lockjaw has been a valuable member of the Inhumans. Now we find out he actually was a member of the royal family at some, you know, so why, why are you treating him like a dog just because he looks like one? That could have opened up to so many different stories. Instead, they backed out. Uh, they did that with uh, North Star also. You know, they, they uh, announced he's gay, but then never did anything real. I think at one point they changed it and that he wasn't gay. He was a fairy, like, uh, you know with wings, that kind of thing. It was, it was so weird. Uh, welcome everyone to England, Tina and Eric Breen discussing John Byrne, or in other words, burning down the house. Ho <laughs> Dalton's here. Uh, it wasn't completely related, but they did do something with the humans and uh, physical appearance. 
they should and constantly. Um, so but if there Dalton, you go. If Dalton were here, he probably would be saying that we're just a couple of talking heads burning down the house. Ah, it's getting worse. All righty, let's move on. What's your number two, my friend? Yes, we are. Uh, we are counting down the top ten, not the top ten. Because we are barely scratching the, we're giving you ten of the best burns, not the ten. Because there are so many great books from John Byrne, uh, definitely in the eighties. Uh, and Anne Nakati's in *Humans* graphic novel it was revealed most in humans wear masks to be more like the ones that have non-human faces. So, Paolo, uh, I, by the way, I like that one. I've got it. All righty. <laughs> Uh, uh, yes, North Star is gay and has been for 30 years now. All right, what is your number two there? All right. I'm gonna t- I'm gonna talk about the you know, Burns Galactus trilogy and you know FF 242, three and four. And I know I touched on this on a previous stream, but um, this is basically you know begins with Terax the the Tamer, you know chasing you know, you know, basically he's racing across the galaxy to get to earth to try to get the fantastic four to help him stop galactus who apparently you know Terex is pissed off so he gets there and you know he basically you know starts a fight with the fantastic four you know cleaves off the top of uh, like a, a city block or something puts it you know up in the air and basically threatens to you know you know, release it if they don't help him, and the issue ends. Well, there's there's a there's a spot in there, and I, I know I mentioned this before, where the thing punches Terex across like f- you know five city blocks, which yeah, if you don't take into account how many people probably died yeah. through that, it makes for a really neat effect. And Burn was very good at that, but um, it ends with Galactus reaching Earth. Well, two forty three is basically a battle issue where everybody fights Galactus. You know, the, the Avengers show up, you know, and after they, the Iron Man and Thor had gotten arrived on the scene, but had to save a tunnel full of cars from, you know, a flood. So by the time they got done with they had to do that before they could, you know, join the battle. And there's a really neat scene in there where, you know, all the, all the, all the Avengers and fantastic four are battling Galactus and, um, you know, Daredevil's watching and Spider-Man comes up behind him and goes, you know, about time we got into the fray, don't you think? And Daredevil says, no, he goes, we, you know, we're just small time super folk compared to them. And he goes, you know, we'd just be in the way, which I always kind of thought, yeah, it's a bit of a stretch because the wasp was in the fight, but yeah, you know, then they, they just agree basically to just hang back and, you know, I guess they figure if, if they're needed, they're screwed. So, well, yeah, Spider Man maybe. I mean, he could lift a car. He's he's stronger than Captain America. But Daredevil yeah. would be like, "Ha ha, Billy Club." <laughs> <laughs> well, not not much to do against Galactus when you're Daredevil. The only thing you could be is you know you could sit there with your radar sense to help everybody else know the movement he might make next. You know that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, um, basically, I said you know what I forgot to mention. I said you. Know, Galactus decides to go ahead and break his vow and he's going to go ahead and eat the earth. So he assembles his machine and he's starving. And right before he can throw the switch, he's attacked by Thor. And that's, that's what begins the fight. And a starving Galactus is able to be defeated by the combined powers of the fantastic four and the Avengers. So he's or based- squirrel girl just by herself. Well, yeah, she hadn't been created yet, but I'm, I'm sure, you know, America Chavez could have sent her back through a time portal to one punch him. Yeah. Yeah. And they they probably did that in a later story. So at the end, you know, he's lying on the ground and he starts shrinking and he's dying. And for whatever reason, they decide, I guess, since he's a fundamental force of the universe Mm -hmm. that he has to be saved no matter what. And so that leads into the, the, the third issue of the trilogy, which begins with, um, you read looking for Johnny storm who has crashed in Frankie Ray's roommate's apartment because what had happened was, you know, Frankie Ray, who had by at this point had superpowers of her own because she was revealed to be the granddaughter of the original creator of the human torch, the Android. Um, she agreed to go be Galactus's new Herald. And 
So and, and as as she was getting you know, you know powered up by Galactus, she basically just lost all interest in anything earthly, including Johnny Storm. And basically, she didn't even say goodbye when she flew off. And they had been in love when the story started. So Johnny, of course, is I mean, this was like you know Crystal all over again. And yeah, so they basically, and then it tells the story of how they were able to save his life and then um you know but you know at the cost of you know johnny's you know great love for a second time and then just like the original galactus trilogy this it kind of ended in the middle of the issue and they basically used the rest of the issue to set up future storylines where you know reed buys the baxter building and um you have franklin the, the, the scene ends with Franklin trying to do Rubik's cube and Herbie comes up behind him Herbie. and, <laughs> and Franklin's getting aggravated. So he just basically incinerates Herbie with a mental blast. And yeah, you know, said so setting up you know, the, the, the you know, future issues, but right. I thought, again, that was, I thought it was a, you know, not as good as 48 through 50, but you know, a, a, a nice, you know, follow up to it and we will not not this time around but there's another burn story that this leads into that we'll be talking about if we do another one on uh on john burn that being said i don't know if you heard but there's a character he was popular in the 80s kind of fell off uh during the 90s and 2000 but his name was wolverine and uh yeah yeah he showed up in x-men for a little bit uh, but he 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 actually was saved by John Byrne because if you when you uh, first see Wolverine, he's a bit mm, obnoxious and he wasn't a favorite character, definitely not of Chris Claremont. But Wolverine saw something in him. Uh, I mean, John Byrne saw something in Wolverine, and he actually wanted to wanted him to continue with the character. And uh, there's an issue where he became Wolverine to everybody else, and that. Yeah, this is a good segue, right? The, and uh, to me, that one issue where all of a sudden Wolverine was this badass, excellent character we all have to follow was issue 133. This, I, I got to tell you, the the month between 132 and 133 is amazing because uh, the X-Men get their butts handed to them. And uh, Wolverine is actually uh, his gravity was increased. I forget the uh, the name of the the Hellfire Club member, but he. Um, I'm seeing if I can find it here. Is that Leland? Le was it Leland? I, I I'm looking for him here. Harry, yeah, Harry, Harry Leland. Leland. Harry Leland. Yes, it was. Uh, but yeah, he increases Wolverine's gravity in 132, sending him into the basement, and he's. Uh, we at the end of 132, we see he's in kind of the sewers, and he's complaining about the fact that the X Men just got their uh, butts turned to him. And then the last panel is him looking up, claws popped, and he goes, "And now it's my turn." And in issue 133, this is Wolverine just tearing straight through the the Hellfire Fire Club. And this, in my opinion, is when he became Wolver F and Reen. I mean, this is when he really became that damn character you want to watch every freaking issue. Oh my gosh, he's so cool! And uh, this is also part of the, uh, hell, the the Dark Phoenix saga. But that's that's the reason I love this. The Wolverine lashes out. You everybody knew issue number one thirty three, and it wasn't because of the role of Black Queen. It wasn't because of all that stuff. It was because what he did to the Hellfire Club, and I remember it and i still like to read it and get those little nostalgia feelies from it <laughs> <laughs> come on you have to remember that issue oh absolutely yes you know i you know the the last panel i mean i can picture it where he's just like looking up saying okay you, you suckers had your your took your best shot now it's my and, turn and claws then, yep. popped and yeah, and that's... then kaboom! Uh, it was is that, and that led to, of course, the Reavers and everything like that. So, absolutely love that issue. It's going to cost you a dollar or two if you want to get it these days. Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, you might want to snag a trade of it, but you're not going to. I mean, it, it, usually it's in the Death of uh, Phoenix Saga or the yeah, Phoenix, and like, yeah, that you're might not, be the most. Not, 
so that might be the most reprinted trade in the history of trade. So yeah, you're not going to go wrong picking that up. All righty. Uh, so dang, we're all the way up to uh, number one. I don't know if you were going from worst to best uh, and, and I can't really, you know, least best to best or what, however you want, but uh, I did. I, you know, that's, if you if 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 it was it was one one a one b one c yeah i know right these are some really good stories uh hold on uh franklin torching herbie ironic that since herbie was put into the fantex four cartoon to replace the human torch because people were afraid that kids would set themselves on fire there's actually a really good issue of fantastic four that deals with that um and Marani, I think the cartoon skipped the torch because its rights were sold to another company. Uh, I, I actually heard the uh, kid set on fire story as well. It could, could be that, though. Uh, hello to Tank Ferret. How you doing? Um, so, okay, what's your number one? Well, I was going to say, I've heard that, too, about, you know, I've heard what Jerry said and what Marani <laughs> said. But, Jerry, take it from me. You do not argue with Marania. <laughs> she tends to know what she's talking about. <laughs> okay. Um, my number one, or if yeah, just my you know, last one of the day is the count nefaria trilogy in Avengers 164. Oh, let me, uh, highlight. Uh, 164, go. 165 and 166. Uh, this Maybe my favorite three-part Avengers story. Yeah, it um, written by Jim Shooter. Found out that this is also you know Jerry Smith's favorite Avengers story, and the reason I bring it up is he's he's also the guy that that films my videos on the rare occasion that I make them. But um, this begins with um, with Count Nefaria has a plan to basically make himself you know. The most powerful, you know, being on Earth, and the way he does it is he recruits, you know, three supervillains: Living Laser, Whirlwind, and Power Man, and with the promise of increasing their powers. But basically, his plan is it will increase their powers. Then, basically, that they'll transfer out of them and into him, only you know, like a hundredfold. So th th there's a you know the the issue. You know, it, it's a, it's a battle issue with the three, you know, supervillains, and while this is going on, the Avengers have been, you know, running across you know foes that have been very difficult for them to beat, and they're basically, you know, they I mean because they went from you know Graviton to the Grim Reaper, into Ultron, into Typhon, and then you know this storyline and. They've been having trouble winning their fights, and Iron Man has been, you know, gone more than he's been there. And this was back after Thor had left the Avengers, and he—the only time you saw him was when he would pop in seemingly out of nowhere if they needed help. And we found out later during the Korvac saga that the Collector kept plucking him out of, you know, the timeline and back to Earth when needed. So they they battle. You know the, the the powered up you know villains, and then and and they're basically getting it handed to them, but they lose their powers inexplicably, and in fact they said you said you know well we won and Black Pants says no they lost and we were cheated of our victory, and then all of a sudden the ground opens up and Nefaria is standing there, and you know which is a shock to all of them because Count Nefaria was a little known X-Men villain. In fact, he was the villain in X-Men 94, but he wasn't super powered. So 165 is, is basically Count Nefaria. I'm going to borrow one of your lines, beating the T totaling hell out of the Avengers. And, you know, it's, you know, I mean, he's so overpowered that no one can even slow him down, including Wonder Man, who at this time was have basically having like an identity crisis because he, you know, he, he, all he could think about was dying again. So it was affecting how he was approaching fights. And um, even though he, you know, he may have had the power to at least, you know, stay with him, he would hesitate and that would cost him. And there's a scene where he basically gets punched through the mansion and he tells Jarvis to check the, you know, house 
you know, check the electrical systems, you know, because you might have damaged them on the way in. And that's when Jarvis says, oh, crap. And he goes to check on the vision who had been in like a res you know, restorative tank since the Ultron battle, you know, three issues prior. And so the rest of the issue basically is them trying to stop Nefaria. And he basically picks up a 40 story skyscraper and drops it on him. And that's when Iron Man shows up. You know, thinking they're all dead and hoping against hope that, you know, one or two of them might have survived. And turns out, of course, they're all alive because, you know, Wanda, you know, blasted out of place for him and Wonder Man was holding up the building until, you know, they could be rescued. And, you know, Iron Man says, you know, maybe if I'd been there and then, you know, Scarlet Witch, you know, starts yelling at him about never being there when when he's needed. You know, and, um, you know, Captain America's taking shots at him, calling him Tin Man. And then Nefarious shows up again. Iron Man tries to fight him. He gets beat pretty easily. And, you know, uh, Wanda tries to stop him. Iron Man tries again. And then at the last minute, you know, it, well, there's there's a scene where, you know, where he, the wizard tries to stop him. And he basically, you know, he beats him with no problem. But the wizard, you know, says, how old are you, Nefaria? 50? Older? He goes, you're past your prime. You've acquired all this power just in time to watch it fade with the dregs of your youth. In another 20, 30 years, you'll be dead. Another Hitler scarring the pages of history. And he goes, and he, has, he has an epiphany. He goes, I give you your life, old man, because you've given mine a purpose. So he decides he wants Thor's hammer. And thinking that's the key to immortality. And at the end of the issue, Thor shows up out of the blue. And so, you know, Thor tries to fight, basically, like, you know, hits him with everything he's got twice. And Nefaria gets up and he goes, wait a minute, he's hit me twice and I'm still alive. He goes, I shouldn't be afraid of him. He should be afraid of me. So he basically, you know, as Thor tries to, you know, do the, the bit where he spins the hammer to create a vortex, uh -huh. Nefaria picks up another building and basically knocks, you know, knocks it over on Thor. And then Thor, of course, you know, breaks out of that and then hits him with his hammer and Nefaria catches it. And Thor's like, odds blood. Can't believe it. So um, the beast, you know, runs back into the house and finds Yellow Jacket in the lab. And he goes, I can't believe you ran from the fight. And he goes, I didn't run. He goes, I'm here doing what I do best, fighting in the lab. And he brings the vision back. And, you know, so, you know, the vision gets out of the restorative tank and, you know, it, 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 more robotic than ever. Or so it seems he goes, where is Nefaria? So he, you know, he goes to fight and he tries to put his hand through him, but he can't. And because whatever it is, Nefaria is you know, juiced up on the vision can't pass through him while he's intangible. But and not only that, Nefaria can hit him while he's, you know, intangible. So he basically, you know, decks the vision and which, you know, is very unsettling to him because he's never been hit while he's been intangible. So by this time, it's basically the, you know, Thor and the vision fighting him. And, you know, you know, Wanda comes in and, you know, Thor, you know, makes a comment about, you know, uh, you know, basically being how, how powerful he is. And Wanda's a great line where she goes, very dramatic Thor, but I, for one, am sick of your last minute appearances and your overblown godhood. If there's anyone nefarious should be where it is I. So she hits him with her hex and you know, staggers him and Thor hits him because I do not deny thy deadly skill woman. Deny thou not the matchless might that is Thor's alone. But of course that still doesn't stop. And, and by, uh, while this is going on, the vision has you know, placed himself a mile in the air, turns to diamond and just drops a mile right on top of Nefaria. And that finally stops him. And we find out that, you know, the, the guy that gave him the power lied about the power killing him. And he turns out he would have, if he had just basically not done what he did, he would have been immortal. So, you know, huh. So that, that was kind of a neat twist at the end because I said when he finds out that when the guy that gave him the power that he thought he'd killed, you know, says, you know, I, I didn't give you this power without a means to control you guys. You're aging, you know, two years for every hour, blah, blah, blah. And he, you know, he panics and just basically starts, you know, doing, you know, 
destroying everything in his path. But it's pretty cool because I said, you know, while this is going on, you know, the Avengers are basically falling apart at the seams. And, you know, that, that issue, you know, while that's going on, remember you know, Henry, Peter, Jairich? Oh, yeah. I always thought it was Girich, but Girich? I, 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 uh, I have no idea. But, yeah, you know, I've only he, ever read it. Yeah, so. he's basically just walking through the you know through all the carnage on his way to Avengers Mansion to, you know, to you know be the the little prick that he would end up becoming. But I mean, they had all the great, they had all kinds of subplots going on through this story. And I'll tell you what I said. Yeah, you know, I know Byrne had a lot to do with you know the the plotting and whatnot. But you know, Jim Shooter wrote the story, and he's yeah you know, pretty underrated as a writer. Yeah, I thought it was a great story. Not by me, because. To me, he's the guy who saved Legion of Superheroes <laughs> low those many years ago. Yeah, no, nah, that's a good pull. As a matter of fact, you got some, uh, you got a couple of praises talking about how it was a good pull. Nailed it, Eric. Love the, uh, love that Avengers story. Best ending ever, says Jerry Smith. Great Avengers arc, says uh, Trusty Sidekick. Making chicken fingers and portobello mushrooms, says Tank Ferret. So they all like that. <laughs> so, Count Nefaria was Madame Mask's real father, which played into some storylines. That's from Aranya. And uh, there you go. Good stuff. Um, and that should be around the time. Did they do a uh, what, a recruitment? I remember when Jarrett Jir- came on, they had uh, Jarrett, whatever you want to call him. They did one. Isn't that where uh, Scott Lang shows up uh, soon you know, after that? This led into the Corvax because the next issue oh, brought okay. in the Guardians. So I'm, I'm way yeah okay yes, I, but that I, was I, a ten part story, and then there was like three fill in issues. Then 181 introduced Scott Lang, and they the, by this time there was like 20 Avengers hanging out in the mansion plus Guardians, and yeah, and that's why they needed to come up because the government didn't like so many Avengers on the roster and insisted yeah. on a, a, a black member. But yeah, you know, Black Panther didn't have it, you know, wasn't able to do it. So they just basically assigned the Falcon. <laughs> assigned. <laughs> yeah. All righty. Now, I've done a, a couple of obscure things, and I figured for my number one, I would go as mainstream as possible. And there's nothing more mainstream than the first superhero of all time. And in my opinion, the greatest of all the origin stories, and that's Man of Steel. Dude. To me, this is the Superman. The Superman between uh, Man of Steel, number one, the miniseries right here up until the end of uh, the end of the run it, that turned into New 52. This is the Superman. I, I love this version. And I think he he depowered him. Um, he made him not so much the uh, the Clark Kent that we saw in the Superman movie, which I think Christopher Reeve played to perfection. But he was uh, still Clark Kent. I like the fact that they made it so his powers developed and he didn't have them as a boy, so there was no Superboy. I always thought that was kind of silly, uh, the the whole Super Baby thing. Um, (laughs) There's so much done done here, and I like the fact that this series went through different parts of his life as it as it went on. You know, you got your origin story, of course. You got. the basics then he meets lois lane i tried to click on it but the computer's taking forever in a day then you've got um that he meets uh Lo- lois lane and he gets his name he goes up against batman because batman wants to check out who this uh, guy is and superman wanted to do the same one of my favorite scenes batman actually tells him that uh if you come close to me if you try to stop me or something an innocent life is going to be destroyed and superman's thrown back by this because this guy, you know, he's telling him he's a hero and yet uh, he's also saying that he's got a bomb strapped to someone um, and uh, they would die if, uh, if he tried to take him down. And in the end it's revealed that Batman struck strapped a bomb to himself and uh, they become not so much friends, but at least respect each other's uh, expect each other's lives and such. And then of course we uh, get, Lex Luthor, which of course that's Donald Trump, by the way, (laughs) Uh, that's uh, I'm about to do a, is uh, the unauthorized biography of Lex Luthor really that good video. But um, it, that one is the same picture as Donald Trump's book, but this, this whole redesign of Lex Luthor was based on Donald Trump. Uh, I, this is my favorite version of Lex Luthor. 
It really is. Cause the whole thing is of course supposed to be mind versus strength, you know, uh, human versus God, that kind of thing. And it's never, uh, illustrated as much when you're dealing with a human Lex Luthor. I mean, you, when you put him in the super suit and all that kind of stuff, you got super versus super. And I think that dilutes the character just a little. I'm not saying it's not cool and not saying you can't get some great stories out of it, but this year of the villain Lex Luthor, who's as powerful as Superman, it kind of kills the point of, of uh, Lex Luthor. But I think this right here, where we find out he's the evil uh, business tycoon, but the city sees him as a benevolent hero, I think that's a, um, that's just amazing. And then, of course, uh, the introduction of Bizarro here. I, I love this series. And it set up the greatest run, in my opinion, of Superman ever. And I'm not saying that with any hesitation, nor uh, any... Uh, uh, there's no sarcasm there. This is the best run of Superman. And I got to tell you, I know I, I heard a lot of people didn't like it, but I loved it when they had the four titles and you got a new Superman and it kind of oh, continued... Yeah. I loved that. It was, uh, and one of the reasons why I liked it is because they had four different teams and they made sure that their issue was out on time and it, it was just done better that, that way. Yeah, you bought a new issue every month, but granted, or every week, but that was also back when they were only a dollar. So <laughs> it wasn't that, that bad. Uh, you have to have read this. What, what are your comments? If you, 1986 getting Man of Steel into Legends, and you like so the the you know probably maybe the two greatest miniseries, you know that wasn't Crisis on Infinite Earths in my 45 years of reading, and that they were right on top of each other. Burn was largely responsible, solely responsible for one, and largely responsible for the other. You know, that, that's what that's why I knew DC was you know, after after 10 years of, yeah, they're nice stories, but they really don't mean it. It's like from that point forward, DC was a more cohesive universe across mm -hmm. the board than Marvel for the next 20 plus years. I agree. Absolutely. I wondered, though, like in the 90s, they came up with zero hour. People are having a hard time with the continuity. Who? What freaking moron is having a hard time with this? It's just it was laid out. It was done so easily. Yeah, uh, I think I heard that was a lot of that was to try to straighten out, you know, the Hawkman continuity. Oh, <laughs> I, I don't. You know, I don't know if that's we, true or not. We had um, to wait another twenty something years for yes. someone to come along and do that one. Yeah, Z Zero Hour, not a huge fan of. But yeah. at least they redeemed themselves two years later with Final Night. Absolutely loved that one. Yeah, the Final Night was excellent. Was. That'd be a, that'd be a good one for a you know stream someday. Is just you know, doing a deep dive into Final Night. Okay. Because I tell you what, that those later issues, I I actually felt like I was cold reading them. That's how it's like that, and you know the early issues of No Man's Land, like the Cataclysm, where yeah. some of the stories were so well done that you felt like you were there. Yeah, actually, to me and in, in my collection, uh, Cataclysm is the beginning of uh, of No Man's Land. I've I've got it right yeah. next to it. I do not. I I don't start with No Man's Land chapter one if I'm going to read the story. I got to start with Cataclysm. I'm very happy that now they actually included the road to No Man's Land as, yeah. as well in the whole set. So you get the whole fall of Gotham. That's a whole other story. We're talking about John Byrne and definitely the <laughs> Superman. Uh, Marania is saying the only Superman that is better than Byrne's Man of Steel is Christopher Reeve. Enough said. I think that does say it all, and I have to agree. His Superman work confirmed that Byrne was an actual genius. Can't argue that. And uh, young Lex, the clone, was pretty damn uh, Alexander Luther. He uh, was supposed to, supposedly the original Lex Luthor's son, according yeah. to the story that they gave. And, and I think they really did toy with the idea of of a legitimate face turn for a couple years with him. Mm -hmm. But uh, absolute fan freaking to Lutely, that is a great story. If you haven't read Man of Steel and you only heard four old farts like us talk about it, check it out. I think you know I. I don't mind. I actually like a man for all seasons. I like birthright, but 
I don't look at those like they, these are the canon. Anytime I'm thinking about canon Superman, anytime I think about this is the Superman that we should follow, it's always Man of Steel. Well, I, I don't have anything against those those stories you just mentioned per se, but it was, you know, unfortunately, a couple of people that had the power to do something about it at DC preferred the Silver Age version. So they were able to basically undo everything that John Byrne had done. And, you know, by the time, you know, as I said, by the time they were finished with him, the only thing left, and I know I've mentioned this before also, was they, the only thing they kept was the marriage. And, you know, if if they, they brought back sniveling Clark Kent, there's no way Lois Lane, you know, falls in love with that yeah. version of him. And I, I always hated the fact that they just did it little by little. To, and, until there was a point where there was no trace of the burn character left. And really the only traces of the burn version, I think showed up in Tomasi's run because I mean, like I said, you know, the, the family man, super, the Clark Kent in that version was, you know, kind of, kind of a little cool again. Yep. Leave it to Tomasi <laughs> to write a decent story. Go figure. Uh, he, he, in all honesty, that was my favorite run of Superman since Burn. Same here. Uh, not saying there's not good stuff between there, but it's just uh, that was my favorite run of books. So there you go, guys. Those are our picks of some of John Burn's greatest hits. How about you? Let us know in the comments below if you uh, haven't been chatting along with us and i gotta thank you very much for the uh for the chat section for keeping the conversation going as well and uh eric how do you think this went i thought it went well i uh, got time for one more question go on ahead do you think stuck around would he have gotten clark and lois married if burns stuck around would clark and lois and clark get married Yes, I actually do. Uh, because of the company man line. When when Warner Brothers or DC would have said, uh, we want the married be to match the TV show, Byrne would have figured out a way to do it. It may have been different, but I think he would have figured out a way to do it. All right. Yeah. All righty. So there you go, gang. Uh, tell us what you think about the top 10. What would be a topic that you would like to see? Let us know in the comments below. I'm thinking uh, about a topic for next week, and uh, I'm going to tease it a little bit by just flat out telling you we were talking about it behind the scenes once, and I like the idea of top 10 heroes that never had a great story. Popular hero, but they, they don't have the Dark Phoenix. They don't have the Man of Steel. They don't have the No Man's Land. So uh, I think that would be kind of cool to talk about. So anyway, checks out again next Tuesday for, uh, for, for that particular list. And as always, thank you very, very much for watching. Have a good night. Good night, everyone.